Good evening, everyone. I'm Kimberly Crenshaw, Executive Director of the African American Policy Forum. Together with the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, we welcome you to part six of our weekly webinar, Under the Black Light, the Intersectional Vulnerabilities that COVID Lays Bare. Before getting started, I'd like to just offer a, a, a few words of reflection. In a desperate effort to acknowledge the unfathomable tragedy around us every day, qualifiers are hoping you're well have become rightfully customary. But a recognition of pain, loss, and marginalization must go deeper than mere hopes. Last week, I noted that ours is a politics grounded in care. That care, I believe, has to manifest at every comprehensible level in our relationships with people near and far, and also in our knowledge of both the personal as well as the global. We've seen in recent days a protest against the level of care that we must show one another. Um, and that protest has been uh, framed in terms of freedom. Now, in our thinking here at the forum, we couldn't concede this weaponization of freedom into a prescription of death for the same populations that bear the brunt of our society's dysfunction all the time. So instead, we want to interrogate how the lack of freedom is measured in terms of constraints on agency and movement, is, is measured in terms of the conditions of segregation, incarceration, dependency, and also economic margin, ma marginality. All of these are ma mapped into a geography of confinement that we want to explore today. So what we want to look at is how this disease is giving us a legible text on how different populations experience disempowerment as a consequence of confinement. Confinement literally, figuratively, and historically. It is within these parameters that the disease's outcomes are naturalized, rationalized, and for some, defended and even celebrated. So as we turn our attention to those who are treated as expendable, within parameters of confinement, we want to lift up the stories that aren't being told so to ensure that no element of this crisis can easily be swept under the rug. We do so mindful that every day that passes brings the wages of confinement to its tragic conclusions. Just yesterday, Andrea Circlebear died from COVID complications after she'd given birth in prison while on a ventilator. She was 30 years old. She was first confirmed, the first confirmed COVID death of a female inmate in federal custody. Tonight, we remember Andrea Circle Bear by understanding the conditions that confined her. And we call on you, our listeners, to lift up her story and so many others. So tonight, we'll start by hearing from Mark Lamont Hill, the New York Times bestselling author, host of BET News and Black Coffee, and professor at Temple University. Nina Cohn, a, visitor, a, a, a visiting professor at Yale Law School, an advocate for elders' rights and access to legal education, will join us. And Ravi Ragbar, the immigrant rights activist and executive director of the New Sanctuary Coalition of New York. We'll then hear from Rebecca Nagel, a writer, community organizer, and co-founder and co-director of FORCE, Upsetting Rape Culture and the Monument Quilt. We'll also hear from across the pond, Alyosha Tudor, a senior lecturer in gender studies at the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS University. Um, she is joining us from London and it's midnight her time and we're so pleased uh, that they can join us. Throughout this social justice SOS event, we want to hear from you. Please share your thoughts in the Zoom chat room Expand the conversation across the social media platform by following AAPF on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and using the hashtag under the black light and the social justice SOS. Now, um, let's dive in with Mark Lamont Hill, who has been closely following the crises that we're currently witnessing unfold in the prisons and jails throughout the country. Whereas we know incarcerated people are being used to produce masks, hand sanitizers, sanitizers, other PPE, while at the same time they're being denied access to that same protective equipment, 
They're being forced to live and work in conditions where social distancing is impossible. So Mark, I wanna start with you by asking, what has been catching your attention? What have you been seeing? How have you been processing what's happening in states of confinement, in particular prisons and jails? Yeah, thank, first of all, thank you for, for the wonderful question. Thank you for inviting me. What, what you're doing every week is so essential at a moment like this. It's an incredibly important intervention into the public conversation. And I think part of why this conversation is so important is because there's been this sort of narrative uh, that COVID-19 is the great equalizer, that somehow all of us are equally affected by it simply because we all have the same, potentially the same risk at catching it that we all are experiencing it in the same way. And I think one of the things that we need to talk about is the role of confinement spaces and, and sort of spotlighting the differences that we experience. Talking about social vulnerability and marginality and the pre-existing conditions that lead to uh, more dangerous and even lethal outcomes for people. So diabetes is one thing, you know, having a high body mass index is one thing, but the conversation about social vulnerability is just as much uh, important to talk about. And no greater example can, do we find that than in jails and prisons. If we look at a place like uh, Wuhan, China, or we look uh, in, in, in Italy, uh, in, in the capital, uh, we will find high infection rates. If we go, you know, but when, we talk, when we're talking high infection rates, we're still talking about, uh, you know, one per thousand, two per thousand uh, of infections. If we go to New York State, we get five and six per thousand. You know, when we get to New York City, it gets more intense. It gets to six, six per thousand and seven per thousand. And then as of April 3rd, when we got to Rikers Island, suddenly well, the idea of an astronomical rate was radically reimagined. Instead of it being five or six per thousand in uh, Rikers Island, it was 54 in a thousand. It was 5.4%. More recent data shows that there's an infection rate in New York City uh, in the jail at 9.9%. That is 30 times uh, the infection rate of the national average. You're talking about, I mean, a death camp that we're, that we're ultimately sentencing people to when we talk about what's happening. Uh, all of us are experiencing COVID differently. Um, the ability to work from home, the ability to establish social distance, all presumes one that you have flexibility, that, you have econo that you're not economically vulnerable, that you're not experiencing economic precarity, that you literally have the spacing to establish that kind of distance. A week ago, down the list of things that you need to have in order to protect yourself. Now, we again, the, the, the less access you have to resources and living wages, the more vulnerable you are. If you're in Rikers Island right now, there's a really good chance that you have no access to a doctor. You have no access to social distance. You have no access to any kind of protective equipment. And you pointed it out. The irony is people are literally, they're literally working for, for, for pennies an hour to make protective equipment people outside of the dungeons and cages of, of, of lockdown while, while being forced to suffer inside. You talk about access, even if they get access to a doctor, many of these prisons and jails have co-pays. The co-pay may be five or $6, but when you're working for $2 a day, you know, or cents, or, or cents an hour, Imagine having a day's having to pay a day's pay to get a, to go to the doctor. So so when you look at these kinds of and, and that's if you get access. So a lack of access, a lack of economic resources, a lack of social distance, and the best thing they can do for you, it potentially is put you in a twenty three and one situation where essentially you're in solitary confinement de facto, which we've established as a form of torture. So in many ways they're forced to choose between the kind of torture of isolation and the potential death threat of being of being in general population. And this type of, of, of circumstance is tragic, but it's even more tragic finally because it's preventable. There are people who right now um, could be uh, released because they're, 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 they're of later age and they're not a threat to society. There are people who are there for parole violations and not, essentially non-criminal offenses. There are 7,000 uh, of those on the desk of, of, of Governor Cuomo right now. We have mm -hmm. six clemency petitions right now on Governor Cuomo's desk. And, and because the bar of leadership is so low, because of what Donald Trump has done in DC for the last three years, we have hailed Cuomo as such an extraordinary visionary leader and stable leader that we are, we're not even generating the type of energy we need to hold him accountable for all the people who are languishing in prisons right now who don't need to. So this is a moment to think abolition. This is a moment to think decarceration. This is a moment to think excarceration. We gotta stop sending folk in. And it's an opportunity to 
really understand that the politics of disposability, which I know we'll talk about later, really is best magnified in what's happening in prisons and jails around the United States. Yes, yes. I'm so glad you brought up that point about Cuomo because, you know, on one hand, um, he is being viewed as the, the savior, the, the, the leader who really uh, cares uh, about his, um, his citizens and is doing uh, all that he can uh, against the recalcitrant president. On the other hand, um, he's a COVID enabler, right? He's, he's, he's not facilitating uh, the release of many of the people who are most at risk. And so on that note, I, I was wondering if it, it, if it would be useful for us to think a little bit more about um, who is there, who we're talking about, and to get at um, another population that, that is also being framed as being, um, you know, sort of abandoned in death camps, and, and that's um, the elderly. And so, you know, it, it, it frequently gets talked about as though people in prisons and jails and the el elderly are mutually exclusive groups of people. Um, they, are, they are not you know, one and the same. And consequently, the conversation um, is somewhat different about the terms of their confinement. But when we really think about um, who's in uh, prison, um, it seems like there's things that that separate framing overlooks. Um, we're overlooking um, uh, the long-term consequences of some of these draconian sentences that were given, you know, decades ago. We were, because we have somewhat of a, a conversation about reforming drug policy, we tend to forget who's still in prison right now. So what does the separate framing overlook that we really need to be attending to when we're talking about uh, people who are in confinement? I think the first thing is we have to, we have, to have an analysis of confinement, right? And, and stop presuming um, that confinement is the inevitable or, or logical outcome of our social contradictions. Mm. And, 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 and confinement and captivity, right? Because we could think about them in, in different ways. Because um, sometimes the confinement is, is a situation where you can't leave like a prison. Sometimes you're de facto captive like you can be in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, essentially is that we resolve all of our social contradictions over the last 30 or 40 years increasingly through through this idea of confinement. So we shut down uh, mental homes, we put you on the street, we make it illegal to be on the street by, by through all these new forms of criminalization. So now we've effectively criminalized mental illness, criminalized drug addiction, criminalized homelessness, criminalized poverty. And in doing that, in some ways it allows us to, to sort of move forward in terms of the, a certain economic model that we have where the, the most vulnerable are the most disposable. And, and, and that's fine if within the logic of capitalism we find troublesome. But as you said, at a long-term level, we then have to ask ourselves, what happens under these circumstances? Do we really want disposable and expendable populations? Do we really want to presume that everyone uh, of a certain sort does not uh, have the same right of agency over whether they live or whether they die? Those are the types of questions that we absolutely have to ask. But we also have to get out of this logic of saying that, that these people deserve it, right? The idea that if you're, in, if you're in jail, you did something bad, so therefore you're, you're, you don't deserve uh, the same type of response and social interventions as other folk, or you know, your your old people die. You know, every everyone dies, and so if you're 80 or 90, then that's okay. Those types of questions, uh, again, presume that, that we naturalize nursing homes and in, in prisons as as the best outcomes for people and what people deserve to be, but we also don't talk about the kind of ethics and and, and moral and moral questions that we have to raise about what it means to cage human beings or to lock people away instead of investing in the elderly, instead mm -hmm. of investing in, in, in social resources that will make people better, that will heal people, that will bring people home, that will make that will bring, produce restorative rather than retributive justice. These mm -hmm. types of approaches could lead to outcomes where fewer people die from COVID. Mm -hmm. And as a mm -hmm. outcome of all we're talking about. Um, yes. Sometimes abolitionists thought of as this kind of pie in the sky thing, but I'm saying in very material terms, a different approach could lead to fewer people dying right now. And that's mm -hmm. something we take very seriously. So, so on that, thank you, Mark. I want, I want to turn uh, uh, full face to the question that we, we've been uh, talking about, the uh, ways in which we can find people um, and dispose of people. And, and uh, nursing homes is another site of confinement. And I want to uh, turn to Nina on this. So one of the earliest images of COVID's entry into our national awareness was the outbreak that happened in Kirkland, Washington. 
And the lethality of the disease to those who are confined to nursing homes since then has only grown. One woman described her 91-year-old father as being on the Titanic, but without lifeboats. Residents and staff are being described as being led to slaughter. Um, they're being described as uh, being confined to death camps. So Nina, could you just give us a snapshot of actually what is going on in nursing homes across the country? What's COVID um, opening up for us to see? Sure, absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so the statistics are, of course, horrible. Uh, over 10,000 residents of long-term care facilities in the U.S. have already perished. It's looking increasingly likely that as many as 50% of all COVID deaths will occur in long-term care facilities. That's not just in the U.S., that's in Europe, that's in Canada, too. So this is absolutely a tragedy. I think it comes to many people as a shock, but it's not actually surprising because it's all the result of choices that our society has made about how we care for older people and older bodies and who cares for older people and older bodies and the conditions under which that care occurs. So I could try to explain that it's not surprising simply by pointing out that we have a longstanding infection control problem in nursing homes, right? That even among those nursing homes that get five stars under our federal rating system, the majority of recent infection control problems. 400,000 people in the US in nursing homes die each year from infection approximately. Mm -hmm. But of course, that doesn't really explain much of anything about why we're in this predicament. Because the question is, why do we have an infection control problem? And why was this happening? And to understand that, I think what you have to understand is that nursing homes bring together these two highly vulnerable, undervalued populations, residents, and direct care staff. So the residents, they're generally old, they're generally frail, most have some level of cognitive impairment, and these are people whose unnecessary suffering we as a society typically tolerate. It's sad, we think, but we treat it as inevitable, we treat it as natural, especially if we don't have to see it. Mm -hmm. And nursing homes provide us a way to segregate these populations and reduce the visibility of their suffering. Then that second population, well, that's the direct care staff. And their low pay, their lack of benefits leads many to hold multiple jobs in the long-term care industry um, and to have very little choice but to come to work uh, sick. Um, so they're ideal vectors uh, for the virus. And I think one thing that, that this epidemic is really exposing for us is that the interests of care providers and residents are much more closely aligned than is typically recognized. So for too long, I think the long-term care industry has benefited uh, from treating these interests as divergent, right? So workers can't be paid more because residents need affordable care or workers can't get benefits because that would take resources from residents. But what we're seeing is that the policies that put workers at risk, put residents at risk. Mm. We could have recognized that, right, before the crisis, because we've right. had research for a long time mm -hmm. showing a correlation between for-profit ownership status and low quality care, between you know, ownership statuses that are associated with better benefits and higher quality care, but the crisis makes this more salient, it makes it more visible. And so ultimately what we're seeing is that these racialized systems that have contributed to a marginalized and at-risk workforce are now contributing to the death of the residents uh, for whom this workforce is caring. Mm. So a lot being- and so, um, one could have predicted at, at pointing out. So the question is, now that it is uh, that uh, became um, the, the, the mechanisms through which this deadly disease was even more lethal, one might assume now has, um, has been commensurate to what's needed at this point. So tell us about what has been the response? Has it ameliorated or in some ways uh, operated to interrupt uh, what this um, march of lethality looks like? 
I wish I could say it has, uh, but it hasn't. I mean, the policy response we're seeing right now, I think is very unlikely to do much to improve residents' well-being. Because rather than ramping up efforts to protect residents and keep them safe, what the federal government has done is dramatically limit oversight and waive key uh, quality of care requirements related to staffing. And what it's also done, and I think this is more interesting and in some ways more profoundly disturbing, is create approaches to intervention that lead to just unprecedented levels of isolation. So the government, federal government, has barred almost everyone from entering these facilities. Inspectors are barred unless they have personal protective equipment, but of course they're not provided with it, um, at least not by the federal government. Uh, nursing home ombudsmen, which are the all critical lay advocates for nursing home residents, are barred from entering, even if they have PPE. Family members and friends, likewise, barred from entering, even if they have PPE, even if they've historically been critical, necessary members of the care team, right? Um, so it doesn't matter that they have a hazmat suit or frankly a space suit. They're not gonna get to see grandma or help grandma. And more importantly, grandma's not gonna get to see them. Um, and yet we've seen virtually no objection to this level of isolation. It's accepted as protective, right? Um, which it is at one level, uh, but at another level, it's not. But the perception of this isolation as protective is consistent with this entire model of care, a model in which people are segregated uh, for their own benefit. And of course, you know, to get back to the, uh, the Cuomo concerns that were raised a moment ago, uh, in some states, uh, we have nursing homes, and New York is one, required to take COVID positive patients, even though it is utterly clear that that is a death sentence for other residents, uh, because most of these facilities simply can't adequately segregate not only the residents, but the staff caring for them to prevent spread to others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that, Nina. So um, as we're moving across then different spaces of confinement and we're actually trying to create a conversation between populations that, as, as you were just saying, um, frequently aren't seen as having common interests, uh, another um, group will be those who are subject to confinement uh, because of immigration enforcement. So um, I want to go to Ravi for this. So Mark and Nina um, launched us into a conversation about different forms of confinement. Um, so much of the risk to older people is written off as just natural. Uh, the risk to incarcerated people has been written off as something they deserve because of the choices they make. Um, so uh, what can you uh, add to our... Uh, tour of different uh, discourses of confinement um, about immigration enforcement, ICE. What are you seeing in terms of COVID and confinement as it pertains to ICE detention and then immigration more broadly? Thank you, Kimberly. I want to use um, two things Mark mentioned, um, one of which is the large, the high numbers of people confined um, in, in, in detention. It, the same applies. In fact, if you look at the, um, some of the projections, our, 70, our most optimistic projection is 70% of the people in immigration confinement will get COVID. A more pessimistic, obviously, is 100%. But the other word that Mark uses is death camps, right? Um, because the likelihood of people um, facing death because of this virus is, is very high. Um, and it is, it is and it will be a death camp for those who are in detention, because one, they don't have any um, way to socially distance. I'm gonna come back to what Mark is saying, socially distance, um, doesn't have any PPPs, doesn't have any resource, medical, the jail, the detention centers, does not have any medical resources to not only test, but also to treat people. So this is a largely a, a, a creating a, a, a situation where people are expecting to die and even when they protest, they, because they want to get released, remember, 
immigration is a civil process. It is a civil process. So everyone right now who are in immigration detention are political prisoners because this immigration is a political process. So we, we, we are seeing anywhere from 45 to 55,000 people in detention. But you look at the background that I have with a child, that is who they are detaining, children, families, men, women, pregnant people, and people who are seeking asylum, people who are looking for help. And, and, they, and you see these women crying out um, for help because they, they, they know that they, it is how, how difficult it is going to be. What is insidious is the fact that these, the immigration and customs are doing two things that it shows their, their, their hand and what they want to do more, uh, why they think it's a death camp. One is they're still picking up people from outside to put them in detention, to take them into the death camp. The other thing that they're doing is that they're moving people around from detention center to detention center so that they will spread the disease. It is a deliberate attempt to put people in detention. And this goes back to the premise of the 96, the 86 laws and the 96 laws where it is not the, how they want to deal with immigration. It is not by creating um, good, good policies, but they want it to be based upon how many deaths are, are, are happen. So if they put, I'll tell people, that if they move people to, if they um, create a situation that people have to travel into the United States through the deserts, the more deaths that they have, the more they, they, they're assuming that uh, people are less likely to come here. The more deaths that they have in this moment, the more likely that people will not want to come back. So the more deaths that this immigration and customs enforcement, this administration, this whole immigration policy um, uh, have, the more successful they are saying they have. That is evil, that is tragic, and that is inhumane. And lastly, to the point from Mark, where he talks about the, um, talks about the, 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 the undeserving, you know, they, they label us so that their conscience will not be pricked. They are good Christians. They're good Christians, right? And I was going to use a strong word there, but they are good Christians who believe that they should, um, they should, they, they, they should, <laughs> they should take care. But what is their care? And that, that care is if we are less than human, it doesn't matter because then we don't, we are, we are not uh, beneficiaries of, of the good, the good word. Um, yeah. Kimberly? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Robbie, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm really struck by the frame of um, death and, um, uh, and fear uh, being mobilized, weaponized as an immigration or anti-immigration policy. And at the same time, um, some sense that they are suppressing information about just how um, how, how horrific uh, the situation is. So um, Amnesty International and uh, some uh, victims and families have said that ICE has been deliberately concealing information about COVID in its detention centers. So I'm wondering whether you see this as evidence or if there's a reason to regard this as a virtual cover-up. Of, of the looming crisis that is uh, playing out in, in these uh, facilities? Yes and no. It is a cover, but it's, the, it's a cover based upon the courts. Um, it, it, all our focus for the immigration allies has been to freedom all. We have, we have put aside everything. Freedom all. And the death camps. And, you know, someone on the chat said, where have we seen this? We have all, all, obviously speaking about Nazi Germany and the mm -hmm. death camps and the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. That's a different topic. Uh, similar, but very, um, that'll take more time. Um, but so everyone has been filing um, uh, what they call habeas corpuses or emergency documents to release people from the courts. And they, they, the way that uh, ICE has uh, responded to that is saying, well, no one is in danger. We have medical attention, we have care. And so they are, the cover up is about for the courts to justify the court's response that they don't, they should not re um, release people is the numbers a lot less than they're showing. Mm -hmm. um, so it is deliberate in, 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 in justifying the court's position. Um, I'm not excusing the courts. The courts know better. The, the judges know better. And we know why those judges are doing this. Again, it is about a, an agenda of creating debt and, and, and destruction. And they want, they, but they, they want, they know the community, you and, 
and all of us are very angry at what has happened. Uh, they, they want to be able to put, a, um, put aside our concerns because the courts are literally looking at this matter. That is not true. The courts are allowing this to happen and we have as much, uh, we need to pressure the courts as well as Congress because Congress has relinquished the oversight on this, just similarly to the courts. Um, I can continue, but it, this is a cover up on, a, on many levels, but the, ho the purpose is to allow as many people of uh, many immigrants, migrants, women, children, men to die during this crisis. Kimberly. Yes, thank you, uh, Ravi. And, and thank you for raising a, again an, an issue that really hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. And I, I think we, we're going to see the consequences of that more than ever before. And that is, quite frankly, the takeover of the federal courts. We often don't um, see the courts as, as being as political as we should, particularly now, and some of the consequences of that. I think this is another moment where um, we can see that more clearly than before. So thanks everyone for getting us started and we're gonna move shortly to our next segment. But first, I wanna ask our artistic director, Awoye Tempo, to give us a brief rundown of what we've been hearing online so far. So, yep. Awoye. Hey, how are you doing, Kim? Hey. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is such a brilliant conversation and there's so many incredible people um, continuing the conversation online, joining from all around the world. Um, there's a number of things that people are talking about today. Um, certainly the cognitive dissonance of the society regarding the Cuomo response. Um, someone mentioned that we're seeing the need for abolition in the most deadly manner. Um, and then there are a number of comments and thoughts too about um, the doctors on places like Rikers who have been sounding the alarm and going to the press. Um, and lastly, a kind of framing about the capitalist formation of the society and how that is hindering the response. So um, it's a very rigorous and exciting conversation. Thank you so much to everybody um, for all your thoughts and comments. And um, we're looking forward to the second part of the conversation. Great, thank you, Oye. So um, we've started by basically talking about how uh, geographies of confinement um, map onto where the COVID virus is taking uh, life um, in disproportionate numbers. Um, now we want to build out from that snapshot to explore some of the historical or political policy context. We call them the condition of inequalities possibility. So we're gonna start by going to Rebecca um, as someone who is studying some of the uh, most troubling elements of coronavirus spread and um, well-versed in the complicated geography of confinement. Um, one of the um, least covered aspects of this moment is that the, the way that confinement serves as perhaps we might call it a perfect storm for violent behavior that occurs behind closed doors. So uh, domestic violence uh, against women and girls has been called the shadow pandemic by the executive director of UN Women. And there are hotspots popping up in countries where COVID um, has done its worst damage, China, Italy, and of course the United States. So can you speak to us about the patriarchal uh, dimensions of violence and what this shadow pandemic is telling us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that's happening right now is that, um, you know, police departments across the globe are reporting an increase in calls for incidents of domestic violence. So, um, you know, some departments are reporting a 20 to 30% increase. Um, and domestic violence hotlines are reporting an even higher increase, um, some 30 to even 50% increase. And so we know um, from previous research about domestic violence that rates of domestic violence go up um, when families or um, partnerships are experiencing financial instability. You know, they go up with negative life events um, like losing a job. They go up with negative life events like being stuck at home. You know, unfortunately, perpetrators 
um, take advantage of those structures that limit people's movement. Um, and so what we're seeing uh, right now, you know, with people being told to shelter in place is that for a lot of people, um, home is not a safe place. Um, and so, you know, the one place that they're supposed to go to, um, to not contract or spread coronavirus, coronavirus might be the place where they're actually the most at risk of violence. Wow. And, and this is part of, uh, of pre-existing patterns. You know, we've been, we've been using, um, the term disaster white supremacy as a way of capturing um, the use of this pandemic as a moment uh, to advance uh, dimensions of inequality that have already been in force, but this gives an opportunity for it to be expanded, deepened, um, institutionalized. I wonder whether there is a way of thinking about this crisis um, either in terms of disaster patriarchy, um, what are the ways that, you know, COVID and the, the idea of sheltering in place uh, provides an opportunity for digging in uh, all the more of some of the dynamics of abuse, some of the dynamics of power and control that we typically see playing out as an expression of patriarchy, an expression of misogyny in sexism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, we're absolutely seeing um, patterns of sexism coming up all over the way that this crisis is playing out, you know, from the unequal way that women um, are more likely to be frontline workers, you know, people who are still going into work every day and putting themselves at risk of contracting the virus, um, especially, you know, women of color. Um, we're also seeing, you know, everyone talking about um, how much work <laughs> Um, taking care of their children and taking care of their house and doing all of these pieces um, of unpaid labor that, you know, because it's traditionally been women's work as a society, we haven't valued. Um, and so I think that um, even from, you know, nurses having to fight to get basic PPE, which we think, you know, both my mom and my stepmom are both nurses. So um, it's a profession that I have a lot of respect for. And, you know, because it's considered women's work, you know, it's something where those frontline workers who are critical to our healthcare infrastructure, we see them, you know, their health and their well being not being prioritized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and clearly predictable, and at the same time, um, disastrous happening in, in this moment. Um, so thank you, Rebecca, uh, particularly for examining this distribution of power and violence. I wanna keep pushing that ball forward and, and move our scope abroad uh, at, for a moment to map the different geographies and modes of confinement. So. Uh, Alyosha, your work focuses on transgender studies, transnational and decolonial epistemologies. So I'm curious to hear from you what's happening beyond certain geographies, transnationally, and also beyond confinement of the nation state. So can you give us a transnational perspective on uh, the current crisis? Hi, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and on this great panel. Um, so what I want to do is to talk about the household, the nation state, um, and the need for anti-nationalism as a response. Um, and so in order to make my point, as you said, um, I will give examples from the European context. However, when we think about the regions, right, when we talk about the US and Europe and so on, we have to think about them in transnational, in a transnational perspective. So basically to put things not to single out the regions but put them into relation to each other and have a global perspective that brings things together and that can allow us to see things in a bigger context. Um, that's what I try to do here. Um, and so this is not to say we're all in, in it in the same way, right? Um, because we're all in it but it becomes very clear and I think that's what the series also is about that you initiated here, right? Um, that we're all in it in this in, in a certain way, 
because of pre-existing existing intersectional power relations, both locally and globally. Um, and so we've been asked to shelter in place um, and to isolate within the household. Um, and also the other contributions here um, have made very clear um, that we have to investigate the pre-given assumptions about the safety of the household and the privilege that comes with being able to shelter in place in contrast to forced confinement to expo like that exposes to danger, be it in prisons or abusive households. Um, and as I want to add, um, we have to look also at the seasonal work migration labor camps. Um, and so the situation is that both in Germany and in the UK, um, the media, media has reported recently that charter flights have brought over, th uh, over thousands and thousands of Romanian workers uh, both white Romanians and Romanian Roma from um, from Romania to um, Western Europe for harvesting the crop. Um, and we see these images of big crowds of people waiting at the airports um, and it shows the absolute lack of protection. Um, these people are seasonal cheap workers. Um, they're staying in mass accommodation and in the British case of course after Brexit they would not even be allowed to settle in the UK. Um, mm. So they're been flown in and then um, the UK can get rid of them again. Um, it's a disposable migrant workforce. And so in Germany, for example, last week it came out that in a meat plant, 200 Romanian workers have tested positive for COVID-19. And these workers are not even employed by the factory. They work for subcontractors. They share mass accommodation. And now they've been quarantined with the Germans, like in this rural, um, uh, region um, regarding the migrants as being the ones who bring contagion to the region and who don't understand social distan distancing and who misbehave in public. Wow, so so, so many parallels. It's, it's very interesting that um, being disconnected, not being able to count on or fall back on a notion of home um, the, the extent to which home, nation, state become metaphors for one another, uh, not functioning for migrant workers, um, being um, essential but disposable uh, seems to be um, a form of confining your uh, contribution in a way that makes you maximally uh, available for exploitation and minimally available for protection. Um, that seems to be a, um, a dynamic that, that we're seeing in, in both places. Um, and so, so you, you've talked about home uh, and nation state uh, questions in, in terms of uh, migrant workers. And I'm wondering as well um, whether uh, there are other ways in which we find it important to disrupt the idea of home as a site of safety and shelter. So in particular, I'm also wondering about um, how patriarchy and heteronormativity uh, create similar yet divergent confinements around the question of home. So um, how do we map onto these nodes of confinement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, what it shows here is that both the normativity and the privilege of the household and the uncomplicated belonging to the nation are connected. And we know that from scholarship on the nation that the family is the small cell in which the nation gets reproduced. And this family is coded in racist, in classist, in heteronormative, in binary gender terms and so on. And it is depending on migrant st status on the question is like who even gets to be part of the nation. And I think here it's very important that also people are excluded from the nation for being perceived as migrants, even if they're not migrants, they're like pushed out um, as they're being ascribed with the migrant history, right? So that's, for example, the Western nation state um, works through whiteness in the way of like in, in Europe very strongly of like asking non-white people, you're not from here, where do you come from and so on, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we see that of course also with people who actually are migrants and who are caught in these spaces in between and who are in the German case constructed by the uh, dominant population as the ones who are doing it wrong and um, who are the deviant others compared to the properly behaving non-pervert German population um, who knows how to shelter in place. 
right? And I think it's quite interesting here that that here there the gender and sexuality part comes in. Um, mm -hmm. We have this overlapping idea: what is the proper family? Um, who? Uh, what is like um, proper sexuality? What is the proper kinship system? And so for me, um, coming from a Romanian migrant family, um, having grown up in Germany, for me, the falling back on the nation state for protection is nothing natural. Mm. Um, and I think um, I was really struck by the fact in the beginning um, how the national has become in this whole crisis, even in critical analysis, the unquestioned paradigm very often. So we could see the drama of national time unfold right in the beginning when this hit off. So we could ask when was the beginning, when it hit off in the West, right? Every nation state started counting from their own first cases mm. and ignored the radical interconnection of what was uh, evolving. Um, so what happens in other countries for a lot of people doesn't seem real. It's not, it's not a thing. So it is like we fall back on this kind of idea that only what happens in our country is real. But for me, from a migrant perspective, and I've seen that in a lot of diasporic subjects and a lot of migrant subjects, there is not this automatism. So um, a lot of uh, migrant and diasporic subjects have been operating in non-national time um, and have seen this coming much earlier because they are following transnational analysis. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so in the case um, I've mentioned before, I think what it becomes clear and also what becomes very clear um, that in the UK, for example, the people who mostly die of COVID are black and ethnic minorities, both in the regular um, population and um, amongst the healthcare staff, as for example, Yasmin Gunaratnam points out. So what we can see is that racism and migration create populations that do not have the protection of the nation state, even if they should have it. Um, and this is what we have to take seriously in our responses. And I want to bring that also to an epistemological level. So basically, what do we do then about our thinking structures, about the knowledge production, right? When we know this, the falling back on the nation state, how can we counter that with anti-nationalism? And I think it's very important that transnationalism does not mean there is like um, a lot of nations sitting around the same table. It means going beyond the nation and going be beyond national thinking structures. Um, and so we have to, at the same time, fight for um, protection and justice, of course, for racialized and migratized group, but also like always have an eye on our thinking structures and see when we fall back into these um, methodological nationalisms in our analysis of the COVID situation and beyond. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, I, um, I want to uh, finally bring in uh, Josie Duffy Rice to this and um, in, in some ways return to where, to where we started. So um, nearly six weeks ago, your organization published an art article that stated, there's no reason that we need to accept these outcomes as inevitable. We don't need to shrug our shoulders when told that an outbreak of COVID-19 is probable in jails and prisons. Can you talk to us about the intentional choices that produce such a disaster in our prisons and in our jails? Sure. So. Um you know, I think the real question here is what is our addiction to punishment worth? How many lives is it worth? And whose lives is it worth? Um, we know that America is extremely comfortable with incarcerating people all um, for decades for, you know, what we would consider small things for decades, what we would consider big things that we actually don't believe in rehabilitation as, as an operating theory and that we have built a system of punishment. Um, and we know that many people in America are also okay with the state killing, right? Um, killing people for wrongdoing. Um, but we're now seeing just this in the past couple of days, the first female prisoner in, in federal prison um, died in the past couple of days. She was 30 years old. She had been sentenced to 26 months in prison for a drug offense and she was pregnant. Um, they were able to do a C-section and save her baby, but her baby will now grow up without a mother, obviously. Her, you know, she's, her life is gone for a drug offense because of this virus. She, she was COVID-19 positive. Um, 
you know, when an ideology is predicated on punishment and we disguise that as justice, this is what, what happens, right? And so we have seen um, for decades overcrowding in correctional facilities, exploited labor, as Mark mentioned, in correctional facilities, inadequate health care, um, you know, maybe one or two doctors at best, no choice in terms of, um, you know, the health care you get um, in a correctional facility. We're seeing 80% infection rates in some places that will certainly reach, you know, up to 99%, 100%. Um, and what we, the, we're really looking at what we are willing to risk to hold on to this very outdated and draconian idea of quote unquote public safety. We actually are now faced with the question of, and to, to bring it back to Mark's Cuomo point, to the question of um, how many people are we willing to kill in order to not acknowledge that all of these people did not need to be in there in the first place, right? And, and that I think is what is actually a huge question for policymakers right now. If we start mass release, if we start releasing people, which is really the only logical option we have at this, at this juncture, if we start releasing people and nothing happens, right, then, then we know that this farce of incarceration as public safety has always what has been what we all know it is, um, a lie, a lie that has been perpetuated, um, uh, you know, upon every person in this country um, for decades. And that also goes for the immigration system. Um, and so we're, you know, we're seeing this fall along class lines too. You know, yesterday I was talking to, um, to a friend named Lawrence who um, spent 27 years in prison and he was mentioning that there are haves and haves nots in prison as well. And that it's, you know, the question of whether you have soap right now, whether you have access to, you know, like Mark said, can pay your copay, whether you can afford um, a face mask. Um, comes down to whether you have a couple of dollars in the in your in your commissary account um, too often, uh, and so we're we're you know this this is the culmination of decades of 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 policy that is centered around purely purely centered around punishment. I mean, there's no other human right, human value that we've you know built out criminal justice policy on for decades except for punishment. And this is what happens um, when, when you know, a, an already bad system is infected with something like this, like this virus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the, what all of you put on the table is, is surprising convergences, different populations, uh, different spaces of confinement, um, different logics uh, of the confinement. And at the same time, a similar outcome, similar vulnerabilities, uh, similar consequences. So what we hope to do in the round table is find more moments of potential analytic convergence, which in turn uh, open up possibilities for uh, greater political uh, convergence. So, you know, COVID uh, creates a text for us to read. Uh, what are we reading it to do? What are we trying to learn from what we're seeing to better enable uh, politics and policies um, that uh, directly interrupt these preconditions. Uh, but before we get there, I want to check in uh, with our social media uh, break one more time. So I'm turning it over to you, Awoye. Hi, thank you so much, Kim. Um, yeah, there's some really beautiful conversations going on and people are actually really deeply appreciative of the complexity um, that you guys are using to theorize about these issues um, and are even forming their own kind of communities and groups to continue the conversation offline. So just thank you so much to everybody um, for, for all your amazing thoughts online. Um, there's a number of thoughts about how the virus is affecting reports of child abuse, uh, the lack of a national conversation about how the virus is affecting indigenous communities, um, and also the lack of information about POs, uh, people of color in, in Europe. Um, and so two larger questions have come up for the panelists. One, um, people are curious about how um, the panelists think the media has been covering the pandemic. And two, there's a lot of conversation about the different ways that data 
um, is captured um, and people are wondering if the panels, panelists feel um, that there is sufficient data collection and where are the places where the panel, panelists would like to see um, enhanced or revised data collection? That's, those are wonderful questions. Thanks, Oi. So um, I'll, I'll take up uh, those two questions and, and the first one uh, seems tailor-made for you, Mark. So how do you think the media has been taking up um, these, these dimensions of COVID, um, the, the, the hidden dimensions, the ones that are pre-written in our uh, social structures, what, what do you, what grade do you give it and, and how do you, uh, what would you use as illustrative of how the media has taken this up or not? I, I, I won't be, I don't want to be accused of grade inflation, so I'm going to say <laughs> a C. Uh, yeah. I think that there's a profit motive in interrogating Trump's uh, ineptitude. And so there's been a lot of critical analysis of Trump and how Trump has managed this and how his mismanagement of this and the sort of vindictive uh, politics that he plays in states that haven't been supportive of him and in blue states, et cetera, uh, have ultimately impacted some vulnerable populations. So almost by accident, uh, the media has covered some of this stuff. Um, but again, the kind of hero narrative that we see uh, coming up, particularly in the New York context, uh, and which is really a national story for, for, for the first month of how Cuomo has become America's real leader as opposed to Trump, has again obscured all the stuff we've been talking about for the last hour, about mass incarceration, about vulnerable communities. Um, and as a result, I think the media has missed, it, missed this. The media is invested in making this feel like it is our national crisis that it is our national problem, similar to 9-11, right? We're all vulnerable, but we're not looking at the Patriot Act. We're not looking at Muslim or Desi or, 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 or other populations who were immediately made more vulnerable uh, and who weren't part of the us. Well, right now, we're, we're talking about an, an us, an American collective us. It doesn't include people who are caged. It doesn't include people uh, in detention facilities, et cetera. And so the media has paid absolutely no attention to this. There's been no what we call solutions journalism approaches, which look at the fundamental causes of this. The only pre-existing conditions we're talking about are, um, are, are high blood pressure and, and, and health and asthma, not, not white supremacy or wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece of this that I want to talk about really quickly was just the, um, the collection of data, um, not just in the national context, but the transnational context. You know, we're, we're simply not testing in the places that, that, that have the most question marks around support. We're not testing the places that are the most precarious. I, I do uh, my, my ethnographic field work in Jerusalem. Obviously, I can't go back to Jerusalem right now for all the travel restrictions. But as I'm reading the reports, I'm looking at, uh, I, I saw a report three weeks ago that showed almost no infections in East Jerusalem, which is, of course, the part that's been occupied since 1967. Uh, it's not that Arabs or Palestinians or, or Muslims or other folk who are in East Jerusalem, Armenians, et cetera, it's not that they don't get COVID, it's that we're not testing it. And so the there's no investment in the testing there. And so the data is not showing because we're not looking there. In my own city, we're not looking at North Philadelphia with the same intensity. And so some of the, the, the low infection rates are not because we, we're doing better, it's because we're not looking, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not counting folk. Um, and that's something, that's something we have to think about, again, across the board, and not just in this nation, but across, across nation states. Yes, yes, thank you. Can we thank you for that. Quick point? Yes, yeah. go ahead, Robin. Um, the, the, the media also has a big responsibility for, for who they bring on to speak. So they're given this president an open, open space. They, they can, they, everything that he says, they are, they are making it public. So that, they have to be responsible for that. But they also need to be responsible for bringing the liars on, like the Giuliani's and the and the, mm -hmm. who are, you know, all, the, all those people who continue to, to say things that propagate the undeserving and, the, 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 um, and those who need to be removed and deported. Um, and it's a bunch of lies, but they're still given that space to do that. So the media itself has to take responsibility for, for creating the space we are in right now. Kimberly? Can I, can I just um, jump in and yes. say that I would, I would agree. Um, I would agree overall with both of those assessments. I would just say that at some places, including the appeal, we're trying really hard to um, not only cover 
the effect that this virus is having, ha having on vulnerable people, but also um, cover the local and state responses to this virus when so much of the attention is on federal response, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, coming into this work with a frame of A, I, I think this is completely accurate, right? Like who is, who should be held responsible? Who ha does not have the legitimacy to talk about an issue like this because they have not earned it? Um, and I think I would put Giuliani absolutely on that list, Cuomo on that list as well. <laughs> and who, you know, where are the places where we don't have enough data, we don't have enough testing, and we are actually putting people at maximum risk instead of this frame of we're all in this together. Where are the places and the outlets that are acknowledging that we're not all in this together, right? Yeah. That, that a virus can can be indiscriminate, but the effects cannot be indiscriminate. Um, so, and, and, and yeah. we can do that. We're a nonprofit newsroom, right? We don't have we don't have some of the same driving values that other ones do because we don't have to make a profit at the end of the day. To Mark's point. Um, and that gives us a little bit more freedom. And I, I want to emphasize too that um, over the course of this series, several of the guests have made it a point to support local independent media precisely mm -hmm. because of this problematic, right? Absolutely. So it you know, would be, you know, the quintessential example, uh, Janine Jackson has mentioned it, Laura Flanders uh, has mentioned it, and several others. This is one of the reasons why. And there's also the question of data that was on the table. And Rebecca, I want to come back to you um, because you've recently written um, about who's left out of the data. So we don't even have information, um, uh, useful information that we can use to, to track it. You know, I often say if we can't really see a problem, it's hard to solve it. So um, what is the data problem that you've identified playing out in Indian country? Yeah, so I mean, we know that with COVID, um, the data that we have across the board is an under report. Um, but what's happening in Indian country, um, the lack of data collection, and then the data on the impact of Native Americans being represented in state and national counts um, is a total crisis. <laughs> um, so I uh, did an article for The Guardian, and um, we looked at all of the states who've released at least some racial demographic data, and over half of those states didn't even include Native Americans in their racial breakdown. Um, we know from previous studies that in medical records, and even in um, death certificates, um, Native Americans have a one in two to one in three chance of being listed as the wrong race. And so from us being, you know, classified as other in public data um, or being racially misclassified, you know, when we get through this round of uh, coronavirus outbreak, there will absolutely be an undercount of the impact on Indian country. And where there are statistics, it's alarming, you know, in Arizona and New Mexico, um, you know, in Arizona and both Arizona and New Mexico, um, the rates of infection and the rates of death are much higher, um, up to two to three times higher than um, the native populations in that state. You know, if Navajo Nation um, was a state, it would rank third of all U.S. states in rates of infection per capita. Um, they're also doing a lot more testing of their citizens, and so that's one of the reasons. But they're experience, experiencing a really um, damaging outbreak, and it's not being counted. Um, one of the other problems is that the healthcare system that the U.S. government created in the 50s to meet its treaty and trust obligation to provide tribal citizens with health care, it's called the Indian Health Services, um, their reporting system is so outdated, um, their press person told us that they're actually collecting COVID surveillance data manually, by hand. Um, and there's another error in the system where um, most IHS facilities don't actually um, provide critical care. They're mostly primary care facilities. And so IHS patients get transferred out to non-IHS hospitals. And so even the data that the healthcare system is collecting about what's happening in specific pockets of Indian country doesn't include hospitalization or even death rates. And so basically, What's happening in Indian country is that native COVID patients are not only facing 
health disparities about the impact of coronavirus, there's also a data disparity, where there's just a complete lack of reporting about what's happening um, in tribal communities. Right. And we know that, that what matters gets measured, uh, what doesn't get measured doesn't matter. So there's a clear uh, message behind um, what, is, uh, what is collected. On the, on the data note, Nina, there's a question for you uh, from Lucy Bernho. She asked, um, she's curious about whether the intersections of the private equity firms behind both the prison system and some significant percentage of the nursing homes map out in some way in, in terms of uh, different death rates. So concretely, are there different rates of death in commercial versus nonprofit public nursing homes and commercially run prisons? So is there the data? And are there any inferences that we can draw from what we do know? Uh, terrific question. Uh, so I haven't seen data about COVID-19. Uh, but we do have historical data looking at quality of care deficiencies in for-profit uh, facilities versus government and nonprofit. Um, and that is strong research. If you want to look it up, Charlene Harrington is on a lot of the papers, does terrific work, um, showing that for-profit status is associated with lower quality of care. Um, so we could predict uh, that we would see that play out in COVID-19 too. Mm -hmm. So not, not at all surprising. Um, uh, there is a question uh, from Chicago. Um, uh, Haley is asking, we're beginning to see a movement with regard to protective gear inside Cook County Jail, but it's not coming from the jail, it's not coming from the sheriff, it's coming from the organizers. We're also seeing bond reductions and compassionate release arguments work at the individual level for county cases, but it's going slowly. Are there federal judges and other jurisdictions who care at all about what's happening in such facilities? So um, are there uh, stories to tell of some degree of success and responsiveness uh, in any of the jurisdictions where organizers are, are really active, active in trying to um, release people? I would say um, as far as success has gone in terms of release, in terms of getting bond reduced, um, all the credit right now goes to organizers. There are in some certain places a judge here, a judge there, or even maybe a, a larger county court that's willing to be responsive on this. But for everyone that is willing to be responsive on this, there are two that are not. And we are seeing nationwide that there's a lot more talk of release, promises of release, and there is actual release, right? Mm -hmm. So in New Jersey, they promised a couple of weeks ago, we're gonna start releasing people. They were kind of the first state to do this. And no, as far as we know, as far as there's any evidence, no one has been released because they're, um, because they're at risk of, of COVID-19 um, in the state level. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think organizers, as always, deserve all the credit for any movement that has happened. And it has been a grassroots, a grassroots effort. And in Atlanta, just a few days ago, where I'm based, I'm, I'm here in Atlanta now, um, a judge, a local judge said they weren't going to even reduce the bond for 183 people who have been granted an opportunity for release if they can afford it. Um, and they're now stuck in the city jail um, where coronavirus is running rampant. What that means is that that judge, you know, alone is, is putting 180 people at risk of contracting a deadly virus because they're poor. That's the only reason. He said that they can get out if they can afford to get out. They can't afford to get out. They're, you know, if they're too poor to get out, then they, then they, then he says, then you are worth risking this virus, right? And so, um, it's not to say that nobody understands that there's a risk here. The question is whether or not they're willing to risk people, you know, risk release versus risk the insurance that people get sick. Um, and the question is whether um, acknowledging that risk actually turns into action, which in a bureaucratic system that is, again, predicated on cruelty is, is actually very, very tough to do, even when you are motivated to do it. And I don't think the motivation is even there. Yes, yes. Well, we, we, we have 
collectively been, been sort of using this prism of confinement to cast light on different aspects of vulnerability uh, to COVID. And of course, the point is to try to figure out what lessons do we learn from looking at these issues sort of uh, sequentially in different spaces, but actually uh, playing out in um, parallel and sometimes overlapping ways. So I'd like to just um, uh, shift a little bit, pivot to thinking about what, what we've learned from this or what we think this moment uh, might uh, present for us in an opportunistic way. So um, I wanna go to, back to Alyosha and ask, um, how might this moment in which the differing politics of confinement have created different levels of risk instruct us uh, as we think forward. So um, we, it, and you've helped us think about how forces and ideologies cross borders and, and the failure to think outside of these borders actually was a risk factor for, for many people. So when you think forward about transnational politics um, out of this moment, what are some of the key dimensions coming out of this that you think are clearly implicated in this moment in our collective conversation about what this moment means? Yeah, like I'm a pessimist person really, um, but I try not to be, right? Um, <laughs> because of course politics doesn't come out of pessimism and uh, very often. So I think there is there is something that can be taken forward and I think that is the the kind, the the both connecting, and this is like a transnational feminist claim, right? Connecting the local and the global, but doing it in a way that doesn't assume um, that there is no hierarchy, right? And so I think what is very important when we look at the level of knowledge production, so I'm concerned with knowledge production as a teacher and um, to how to make sense of the world and then also the meta reflection, how to make sense of making sense of the world, right? So what are the tools that we can find now in this crisis in order to um, reflect not only what's happening, but also to reflect in which terms we frame what's happening. And I think there is very important to to um, look at different sources to, like you mentioned, the media and the, the local smaller independent media. And I think there is important to add there also to um, the transnational media, right? So to have uh, um, not only that one story that's being told, but have different stories from different perspectives and bring things into relation. So things are relational, right? They're not relative to each other they're not the same but they're interconnected and i think that what i would hope for politics and for um, anti-racist um, queer feminist trans feminist politics to go forward from here is this kind of the the idea of the interconnection to take that forward that things are interconnected and that we have to look at the bro the bigger picture but then bring it to the local um, again, um, and that it is not possible to explain things only from within the nation state. The nation state always needs the regulation from the outside deconstructing it, going beyond it. It needs anti-nationalism and not only a better, a better nationalism, actually. It needs an anti-nationalism in order to deconstruct all these problems that we see from the household um, mm -hmm. to the family up to the nation state. So, so that, um, thank you for that. It makes me um, remember something, Robbie, that you said. Um, so building off of the anti-nationalist um, sort of politics, there's also the question of anti-racist, um, anti-nationalism. So you had been saying earlier that in, in, in a, a significant amount of the discourse about um, uh, immigration, the ability to actually identify racism playing out of it is somewhat muted in the conversation. So, you know, taking, taking full stock of the, the notion of building a politics of anti-nationalism, how does your critique of the racism in immigration also uh, provide an anchor to an anti-racist, anti-nationalist, you know, full accounting um, of this moment going forward. So the, the, the immigration policy in, in America started um, based upon immigration, the Chinese Exclusionary Act. What a lot of people don't know is that um, Hitler himself came to the US, saw the immigration policy 
And that is what he implemented in Nazi Germany. He saw it was easy for him to manipulate people based upon that. Um, we still continue to see the racism in, in uh, happening right now um, with immigration. And you know, migration is a natural process. So we, we, we should not be criminalizing this. We sh it is a political decision whether or not we allow people to come in or out. This moment, you know, coming back to the question you asked earlier, what we are learning in this moment, we are learning that whether you are a Latino, Black, um, uh, an immigrant, um, poor, we are learning that we are all at risk if you're talking about nationalism and if you're talking about whiteness and if you're talking about supremacy, white supremacy. We have a nationalist, white nationalist president. He has put his cronies in all in power and we have, fit, we have seen the impact of um, when you don't know how to run a country because all your whole premise is about hate, you are seeing the death and destruction of our community. But it doesn't matter because we are expendable. As, as everyone has said, we are expendable um, so that uh, we, it, there's no loss to them and that, they, and, and, and that everything runs um, to protect them and their, and their businesses and their, their monies. So mm -hmm. what, what I would say in terms of we have to learn to understand that what we need to do is work together. I don't care what you are. I don't care if you're, you know, whether you're a woman, white, black, but if you're not a rich white man, billionaire, you are, you are in this fight together with us. Um, LGBT, pregnant, you know, you name it, we are in this fight together. So we need to take stock and to stop this. Kimberly? Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. So let's hear from our last four uh, panelists what uh, is inspiring them or what they would put on the table, even if they're not necessarily optimistic people. Something's getting you up every day. Something is pulling you through this moment. There is something that you are pointing to uh, as the way forward. So um, in uh, one minute or less, uh, tell us what that direction is. I'm going to start with you, Rebecca. Yeah, um, you know, one thing that I'm inspired by by Indian country is, you know, people who are taking the lead, you know, whether it's, um, you know, native journalists, like there is, uh, with the lack of data, um, an independent newspaper called Indian Country Today, with their, you know, editorial staff of about 16 people, have been compiling all of the COVID-19 cases in Indian country that they can verify and creating a map um, that also includes tribal affiliations so that we can see how it's impacting different tribal communities. Um, and those are just native journalists doing it on their own. Um, Lumi Nation was one of the first places to have drive-through testing. Um, you know, I think we've seen an outpouring of support um, for Navajo Nation and other tribes that are experiencing outbreaks in their communities. And so I think all the ways that um, the federal government is failing to live up to its treaty and trust responsibility right now, um, we're seeing tribes show some real leadership and you know, people in their communities um, you know, fighting to protect each other from COVID-19. So amidst all of the things that uh, make my head explode, um, that is one of the things um, that uh, brings me hope. Thank you. Josie. Um, well, what's currently keeping me moving and also keeping me in bed at the same time is that I'm <laughs> expecting a baby soon. So that part is uh, <laughs> um, kind of have to keep my spirits up because <laughs> absolutely <laughs> another life in this world. So um, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. But I, I would also say, you know, um, it's an interesting time for people's politics to be shifting. And I don't want to imply that this is worth that because this is like a tragedy not worth any of the all you know any of the other outcomes but uh, you know to the extent that um it's been easy for so long to write off things as not that bad or the risks as not that high um we're giving people i think a framework in which, and I, by we, I mean all of us, in, in which to rethink how they view the world outside. And my hope is that that, that lasts longer than this virus does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uncertainty is 
not, you know, the, the level of uncertainty we feel right now is at least one that I have been feeling to, to increasingly over the past couple of years, I think. And, and, um, and uncertainty is uncomfortable and it's scary. And sometimes it's also necessary. The virus itself is not necessary, but, um, but rethinking where you fit in and where your family and community fits in in the larger picture, I think is, is a critical practice. And so um, that, that gives me some hope. Thank you. Uh, Nina. So I guess my optimistic take is that I hope this crisis will give us a chance to rethink why we're segregating, why we're warehousing uh, people in institutions in the first place. And to recognize that that cost isn't evenly distributed, mm -hmm. uh, that income inequality, rampant poverty, the choice we make not to value family care work that could keep people out of these institutions uh, means that some people can't afford not to be in them. And to understand that these are really sites of cumulative disadvantage. And then I guess my other hope is that maybe this will finally make ageism uh, more visible and uh, lead people to see how our society's willingness to devalue older lives and to fail to recognize the value that older adults bring. And frankly, our society's disgust uh, for older bodies has some very, very real consequences. Um, and, and maybe it will make us less willing to accept the institutionalization of older adults. Thank That's you. my Thank you. And Mark. I, you know, similar to what Joseph said, I mean, I, I think part of what has excited me, despite the, the despair, and again, none of this is worth it, right, as everyone has said, um, but in the last seven weeks, we've seen a nation at least begin to have a conversation about letting people out of prison, mm -hmm. right? We don't need to be there, right? We've seen a nation find money when they never could. The conversation about reparations comes up. Where would we find the money? How we? What about what about the logistics? How do we? How do we get, suddenly, we're just writing checks. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at the Paycheck Protection Plan, money just going out, right? Again, just what's possible. In seven weeks, an entire nation has become aware of social distancing, about masks, about hand washing, about all this epidemiological stuff. We have more knowledge about medicine, perhaps, than we ever have before. Now, the question is, if in seven weeks we could do this, we now have a broader imagination, a broader social imagination and political imagination. We can now imagine what is possible in more robust terms, but also in more tangible terms. We will no longer accept that it's not possible. We will no longer hopefully accept that there's not enough money. We will no longer accept, well, the people can't be educated. Now I'm thinking abolition, I'm thinking socialism, I'm thinking political education, I'm thinking beloved community. I'm thinking all of these things, which were always possibilities, are now more tangible and imaginable to a wider range of people. And so despite the despair and darkness of the moment, I have never been more certain than at this moment that we can and that we will be victorious. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, so times of crises are times of opportunity, they're times of risk. And part of what we've been trying to do here is curate the conversations that help us maximize the possibilities um, that, the, that the opportunity can be grasped and that we stay off uh, some of the worst consequences of this moment. So I wanna thank you all for joining us uh, in this endeavor. It would not have been possible without the time and effort of our entire team at the African American Policy Forum and the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. And of course, this very special thank you goes out to all of our panelists, Mark Lamont Hill, Ravi Ragbir, Aliosha Tudor, Rebecca Nagel, Nina Cohn, and Josie Duffy Rice. Thank you for helping us think our way through this crisis. This has been an inspiring and necessary conversation, and we hope that you keep listening to these kinds of conversations and share them with your friends, your families, and within your communities. You can follow this conversation by following AA Policy Forum across social media, including on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can keep this conversation going with me uh, by following me on Sandy Locks or Kimberly Crenshaw on Instagram. 
And please head on over to our website, aapf.org, as we will continue to provide information, resources, opportunities to galvanize this collective experience into an energy that can pr promote us into another universe of possibility. We'll be doing it through the blog on our website and as well as on our podcast, Intersectionality Matters. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. We'll be posting this conversation next week. We're also invited, uh, excited to invite some of our listeners tonight to an after discussion. Uh, we've got Jason Wu, J Jyoti Nanda, Lisa Burke, Charlie Mullins, uh, Deja Love, and Haley Bopintesta. You're coming to the post-show talk back with myself and some of our panelists. Also joining us is Barbara Arnwine, who tuned in this week after being one of our brilliant panelists two weeks ago on episode four. So join us. Under the Black Light continues next Wednesday, featuring writers from across multiple genres as they think through narrating the nightmare and reimagining the possible. Throughout this series, we've heard from scholars, activists, and thought leaders about what's happening on the ground. Next week, we're asking writers what could be. We look forward to you joining us for this kaleidoscopic conversation. Until then, take care, be safe, be well.